go again. Now we're going to talk more specific changes, actual phys uh, specific behavioral changes in the presence of other people. This is one of my favorite studies in psych. So um, in this study, what happened is it's a rope pulling apparatus. You see there's six positions there. And so what happens is they bring in six people, right, and five work for the, unit, the researcher and one doesn't, right? One's an actual participant. And so they, they have all six people pull on the rope to their maximum extent. How much are they able to pull? Okay. Now then, we're going to put them, blindfold them, and put them all on the rope pulling machine. And the real participant is at pos uh, position one in the front there, okay? And so then there's, you know, two, three, four, five, six. And so then what happens is that the people at four, two, three, four, five, six lift the rope and kind of make it pull tight a little bit, but then they just grunt and pretend to pull, okay? And so now we can see how much person one is pulling. And it was just an amazing thing because if person one believes that they have six people behind or five people behind them, they, they put in like half of the effort as when they were alone. It was just an amazing thing. And so you get this, this problem in the presence of others, we can socially loaf, right? This is like the old group project effect, right? You're working with a group of people and inevitably you got the, 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 the guy, we call them free riders, okay? People who benefit from the group but don't give their fair share. And so free riders are a problem not just in, you know, group projects, but I'm going to say it. our president, yes, he's our president at this point in history, Donald J. Trump, he did in fact um, go up to NATO and tell NATO, guys, um, we got a problem, okay? Because each and every one of you, when you join NATO, it's a, it's a defense agreement each and every one of you committed yourselves to spending 2% of your annual budget on defense, okay? And a whole lot of you European nations, we're looking at you, Norway, a whole lot of you European nations aren't putting in your 2%, but you expect the full protective umbrella of NATO. Well, that was the ultimate free rider. And I mean, he was right. He was on to something. Shh, don't tell anyone I said that. But... There was a point there, right? It's absolutely true. If you set up a situation where everybody gets the same benefits, in, in, independent of what they put in, you're going to have free riders. And so you find that social loafing is, is uh, less likely to occur if the task is very challenging. If it's one that you're motivated to do just because, well, t appealing and challenging. It, it challenges your, uh, your, your, your capacities. It's involving. Sounds like appealing and challenging. Um, but this next one, well, I'll, I'll go to the last one. Members are friends. Those are all great. But this next one is crucial because what's going to happen is on this slide. So you got a group of people. Are individuals going to show social facilitation or are they going to show social loafing and so what we find is that you've got a situation the outcome that you receive is a product of everybody's efforts put together okay and if you're in a situation like the rope pulling where you believe your individual input cannot be identified you'll have social loafing but if you believe like in a relay race or something like that, you know, you know exactly, you know, the, you, you win or lose based on the time of four people working together, okay? But you can see on a relay race when the baton is passed off or something. You know exactly. And so what we find is that churches use this. I, uh, I've seen some of these churches. What they do is because social loafing occurs, you know, they can look at their total donations. They can look at the number of people in the church. And it's just not hard to figure out. Not everybody tithes, okay? And so everybody benefits from the facilities at the church, but not everybody tithes. So what some, uh, because guess what? Nobody knows if you didn't tithe, right? Except God knows. All right, that's another. So some churches, what they'll do is they'll actually publish donations in the church bulletin. Make it public record. And by doing so, greatly enhances or decreases social loafing, shall we say. Group polarization. I swear we talked about this earlier, but who knows? Maybe we didn't. But what happens is that um, members that, especially members are... Um, that are somewhat similar to each other to start with become really similar. But they don't even really have to be that similar. Just people that 
that come together become even more. Here's group polarization. What they did was, uh, which one was it? Hey, yeah, the one on the right, I remember it pretty good. I, I swear we talked about this, but uh, you'll know. But we find that um, they, they did a pretest on a bunch of people, and they identified some people that were high prejudice and some that were low prejudice. And so then they isolated the high and the low, and they sent them off to have group discussions about prejudice. And then they brought them back, and they measured their prejudice again. And those who were high in prejudice, after talking to other high prejudice people, came out even more prejudiced. And those who were low came out even lower. Okay, so it's a, an amazing thing how they they polarized and became. This is what happens in universities, for example. Freshmen come in with opinions all over the board. Seniors tend to be very very similar in their opinions. Okay, we find that people often self segregate by neighborhoods or something, and they interact with each other, and they become even more like minded. The internet has created a whole new, whole new area for this. The one that troubles me a lot are these anorexia support groups. So what happens is girls with anorexia, and it's not support like a good psychotherapy support, okay? Don't get too, no. Girl, I'm sorry, it's a boy thing too, but it's almost always, you know, whatever. I'm a sexist. So people with anorexia will go out there and basically talk to each other about their anorexia and literally become more anorexic as, as if that was physically possible. But they polarize and it's just like the, the high and low prejudice groups. Huh? And clearly group polarization occurs in terrorist organizations as well. So some members might not all be all that extreme, but being interacting and pretty quickly they are pretty extreme. So what's going on here now hopefully these these sound familiar informational influence and normative influence a better sound familiar from our um, conformity and obedience studies right so informational influence discussing with a group pools ideas gives us new information okay we polarize because we share information but probably more likely it's these normative things what happens is that um, you're in a group and they're somewhat extreme and you're not extreme and you don't want to be the outsider so you start to slide your opinion maybe towards the extreme a little bit and once you slid a little bit towards you it's a little bit more and a little bit more and so this social comparison problem we're worried that others will think poorly of us if we have a different opinion combine that with plural, pluralistic ignorance remember this is the idea of if you're in a group of people and yeah, you, you just if nobody says anything that everybody thinks it's a good idea okay and so this pluralistic ignorance is going to be at the core of the next thing that we're going to mention here which is group think so um you know are two heads better than one are three heads better than two you know is group decision making better than decision making made by an individual okay so group think is a mode of thinking that people engage in when they want to agree. It's a cohesive in-group. Um, and so what happens is that the group wants to co be cohesive so much that even though once they come up with an idea, nobody wants to break the cohesiveness and say, hey, maybe we should look at an alternative. Nobody wants to do that because you want to have a cohesive group. And so groupthink is more likely to happen with a group that's already cohesive, of course. Um, and a group that becomes isolated, if you isolate a group from other viewpoints, you're likely to lead to groupthink. And if you have a directive leader that clearly states what they want, Okay? And so groupthink was a humongous problem in a lot of places, in particular in Japanese businesses. When the Japanese businesses were starting to really ramp up after World War II, they found that their Japanese culture was interfering in their business model. Okay, Because what was happening is because um, Japan has a, most Asian countries, but Japan has a real hierarchical structure. And, you know, you don't you don't upset the balance of a hierarchical structure, right? We've talked about, you know, the um, collectivistic nature of these, these things. But the idea is that you don't want to break up the harmony. And so 
what will happen is the boss will come in and say, I think our company should do this. And so nobody, everybody is, number one, you, they're afraid of, of contradicting the boss. And so it creates a condition where you don't say anything. But guess what? If any other person was to say, boss, I think it's a bad idea, you jump right on. I agree. That's a bad idea. But because nobody else is saying, boss, I think that's a bad idea, there's pluralistic ignorance going on. Everybody believes yeah, nobody's saying anything, so nobody must have a problem. Everybody must think this is the best plan of action. There's a lot of evidence showing that groupthink was at the core of the, um, the which one was this? The This wasn't Columbia. This was, oh, which shot it blew up? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm a terrible, terrible child of the 80s. Anyway, uh, Challenger. Not that bad. All right. So many people believe the Challenger shuttle disaster was was clearly the result of groupthink. So how can you prevent groupthink? Because boy, I mean, having ten people work together is an important thing because each person can bring in a unique perspective, different points of view, etc. Well, you can try to be impartial, especially as the leader of the group, until it gets to the point where you're actually going to vote in the group. Don't endorse any one position. Present every position as equally meritorious as every other one. Encourage a devil's advocate. Okay, Jim, it's your job to tell us all the reasons that this is a stupid idea. Okay, go tell me. Okay, no judgments. Go. Subdivide the group sometimes. Take them apart to have individual group discussions and see if they come back with something different. Okay. Huh? Bring in outside experts. Allow them to critique you. Okay? And then before you actually implement it, give some time for this to sink in. Have a meeting where is there anyone here that has even a lingering doubt that this is the best plan of action? And if anybody expresses any doubt, you know, no consequences, just tell me what you got, you rethink the plan. Okay? All right, so there we are we're talking about how you can be influenced by the presence of a group and in the next presentation we're going to talk about how you can influence that group okay so see you in a while